into the Word. <clears throat> Turn with me to uh, Ephesians, the first chapter. <clears throat> and uh, I also want to say it's really great to have my family here, my son and, and daughter-in-law and our three grandchildren here, as well as uh, uh, Monica's parents and uh, from Kansas here. We're all celebrating Toby's graduation from high school this week. So, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> the place where the truths of God's word become real first is in our families. And uh, I want to talk about that today, as well as in the body of Christ, which is the church among the saints. And uh, so in, in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, the first paragraph is when Paul talks about all of the blessings that are ours in Christ. In fact, in those first 14 verses of the first chapter, 11 times Paul says, in Christ or with Christ or something like that, it, all of these blessings are ours in him. So everything that, that we enjoy, that we benefit from, is in Christ. And so then after he goes into that, uh, he begins a prayer in verse 15. And it says this, Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Let's just stop right there for a second. You're in a series now with your pastor. You've been in one series where he was teaching us about the attributes of God. And uh, God is holy. God is God. <laughs> God is uh, um, omniscient. He knows everything. And after we did that, then we, your pastor started teaching about how we in, enjoy these things in our own life that makes us like him. And uh, so today, uh, today we're talking about uh, the, 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 the knowledge of God. And before that, it was his omniscience, that he knows everything. Now, only God knows everything. He's omniscient. We're not. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is omniscient. I'm not. <laughs> But I can increase in knowing more about him. Not just about him, but knowing him. Yes. Amen? So that's what he said. Paul's praying for them that they would increase, that God would give them spiritual wisdom and understanding so that they might grow. That means increase in their knowledge of God. Okay, then going on. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same power that raised him from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under Christ, under the authority of Christ, and he has made him head over all things 
for the benefit of the church. Did you get that last phrase? For the benefit of the church. Jesus is not just out there. He's not just over it all. He's not all powerful. He's not just all knowing. He's not just able to do anything. He is there for us. Not just to give us everything we want or even everything we need. But we have the privilege, as we're going to see in this text this morning, of participating in everything that he has. We're going to see that in a minute. It just excites me as I study this and really dig into it because everything that God made possible in Jesus, he's made possible for you and me. Everything. And we're going to see that. Do you believe that you have everything that Jesus has? Do you really? <laughs> we don't always act like it, do we? Sometimes we come begging. We don't realize we have great privilege because we're called sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> this is a prayer that Paul prayed. He prays it for the Ephesians. Now, the book of Ephesians was first written as a book for all believers in the first century. It just later came to be called the book of Ephesians because it ended up in Ephesus. And it, it, when they copied the scriptures, they then said to the Ephesians because that's where it ended up. But this is a book about the church. So if you want to know what the church is supposed to be, and the church is not this building. The church is not this service every week. The church is all of us. Amen? So what are we to be as we follow Christ? Well, he wants us to know three things, to understand, to comprehend the three benefits, the three ways that he works in our lives for our good. And the first one is, the, what is the hope of his calling? Now, hope is, uh, and this is in your notes, this is the first one, the hope of his calling. When you hope for something, you're not just hoping that it'll happen. In the biblical sense, when you hope for something, you're waiting for something you know is going to happen. You just don't know when, or you don't know the full extent of it, perhaps. So, Lord, help us to understand what is the expectation, the anticipation that we have of your, call, of your calling. Now, these three things are not, they're ours, but they're only ours because they're first his. It's his calling, not our calling. It becomes ours because first it's his. Now, notice what he says here. Uh, we're, what, what are we called to? Um, what do you, well, you, some, of, it, it's, some of the answers I'm looking for are in your notes, so you could just tell me. <laughs> the first thing is we're called to eternal life. When you accept Jesus as your Savior, what do you get? Eternal life, exactly. When Jesus was praying, I believe this was in the garden before his crucifixion in John 17, he said, uh, Father, glorify your son as your son glorifies you, as you have given him authority to give eternal life to everyone that you choose. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's why it's so important that we understand that God made eternal life a possible for us through Jesus. It's not a possible through any other means, by our good works or our efforts, our desires, uh, our hearts longing. It only comes through Jesus. And what is he called to be, us to besides uh, eternal life? He's called us to be image bearers. <clears throat> uh, 
Paul wrote to the Galatians. Um, Pastor mentioned that you're going through the book of Galatians on Wednesday night. And in chapter 4, he says, I am undergoing birth pangs. Now, maybe this afternoon, <laughs> Shay is going to begin to experience birth pangs. <laughs> She's looking forward to that, but then once they come, she won't be. Because <laughs> they hurt. But Paul says, he's using a female analogy to say, I'm experiencing spiritual birth pangs. For, so that each of you will become conformed to Jesus. So as she births this baby... She's going to give it all she's got. And God's going to bring forth new life. So how do we apply that spiritually to our lives? You got somebody that needs Jesus? You got to travail for them. Like a woman in childbirth. So that Christ will be formed in them. That's the way it starts. It starts in prayer. And then God will open up doors, maybe for you or somebody else, to bring a word or a testimony or something to draw them to Jesus. So, how is Christ being formed in me? I don't know how many, maybe not many of you, because some of you have been in the church for almost as long as I have. And uh, you may remember the old song, Oh, to be like thee, blessed, blessed Redeemer, uh, come in your sweetness, come in your wholeness. The last line is what I'm interested in. Stamp your image deep on my heart. See, that's what becoming like Jesus is. It, we actually begin to act like him. Say, oh, that's impossible. Yeah, it probably is impossible, but we can begin to experience that. And that's what we pray for. That's what Paul prayed for these Ephesians. Second thing is to be transformed. <clears throat> In uh, 1 Peter 2.9, uh, the Apostle Peter says, He has called us out of darkness into what? His marvelous light. Yes. So, we're, we're being transformed as we come to Christ. Out of darkness into light. And then we're, to, we're called to be inter, inter, influencers. <clears throat> Jesus said in the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, when he started his preaching, he says, you are the salt of the earth. What does salt do? It's a preservative. It keeps meat from decaying. It it's, preserves it. it. It keeps it healthy. And then he says, you're the light of the world. Like a, a lamp set on a hill. You're a, a city set on a hill that attracts other people to it. And uh, so that's what we are. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We're influencers. And finally, we're called, among other things, to be fruit bearers. Jesus said... In the upper room discourse, when the disciples were gathered at the Last Supper, he says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. What a blank check. Now, that's not just saying, Oh, well, then I can ask God for anything. See, I'd like to have a Mercedes Benz, you know. Well, that may not be God's will for you. But what is his will for you that is going to establish his kingdom in your life, in your family, in your neighborhood, in our world, in our city? That's something that God can agree with. And he will do it. Whatever you ask in his name, he will do it. Wow. What a, what a beautiful thing. So we're called to know Jesus, and we're called to bring people to know him. This is the calling. This is his calling on our lives. The second thing that he, uh, Paul prays for is that 
that they would know the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now that's future, but it also has present significance. Uh, it, Peter also says in his first epistle, in the first chapter, we've been born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that is, into an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, and uh, doesn't fade away. And it's reserved in heaven for us who are kept by the power of God. That's something future. We've been born again to an inheritance that's never going to pass away. It's going to be ours forever. But then there's a present reality to, to this inheritance. It's not just a future promise, but it's a present reality. What's the present reality? Well, <clears throat> look up at the, the, this chapter that we're already in. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. He said, when you believed in Christ, you were marked with a seal of the promised Holy Spirit who is the down payment of our inheritance. Remember when you bought your house? One of the times, or maybe the last time, and uh, you knew what the sale price was, and you couldn't pay that in cash, perhaps, but uh, in order that they would save it for you, you put down a down payment, 15 20%. And that guaranteed that that house was yours to purchase as you made payments along the way. Well, the same thing is true when we come to Christ. The inheritance that God has promised us to live with him forever and to enjoy and to rule and reign with him on this earth for a thousand years. All of that is going to happen in the future. But the present reality is when we believed in Christ, he gave us the Holy Spirit as a down payment. So what I've promised you, I'm going to pay in full when I come to get you. But right now, you have the Holy Spirit. What better down payment could we have than the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, right? And so he's the one that helps us to take possession of some of the things that God has prepared for us that we can enjoy in this life before we pass into the next. And uh, that, that's a beautiful reality. Now, this isn't in your notes. Well, it, it is, but it, the scriptures aren't there. But let's turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Romans chapter 8. The next point I want to make here is that we are, part of our inheritance is that we have been adopted. Adoption is the same in Scripture as sonship. And uh, there's a, well, let's, let's read the passage first. This is in Romans 8. Uh, Romans 8 is one of the high points of the whole New Testament. It ends up with saying, who can separate us from the love of God, you know, and so forth and so on. It's beautiful. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us and gave himself for us. But he starts out by saying, when the Spirit is given to us to help us to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. And then in Chap in uh, verse 14, for we know, no, I'm sorry, for, yeah, 14, uh, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, in Scripture, or in the Greek language, there are four words that are used to describe children. There's a, there's a word for infants, there's a word for Toddlers or children, uh, elementary age. There's a, a word for teenagers. And then there's a word for sons. And that word is weos. Uh, H-U-I-O-S. Weos. Say that. Weos. 
Okay, that's what it, that's what uh, the Greek word for son. And uh, then in this passage, when it talks about adoption, it says, it's two words. It's the word sons and the word to place, a verb. And you put them together and it's weothesia. And that means adoption or sonship. Now, let's finish reading there. So, uh, you did not receive the spirit of salvation or of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, reostasiah. That's adoption, okay? Uh, and it also means sonship, as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Isn't that amazing? Because of being adopted into God's family, or becoming sons of God. We now are heirs of God. You know, one of the things you live for as you get older is what you're going to pass on to your heirs. What inheritance am I going to leave for Toby and Quint and Bella? You know, see, that's part of what we live for, that we accumulate certain things, not only to take care of us, but to bless the next generation. And Paul is saying here that when we receive Christ, we become heirs of God. In other words, we receive his inheritance, which is infinite. Think of it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are rich. <laughs> You really are. You become an heir of God, and even more than that, a joint heir or a co-heir with Jesus. Now, Jesus is the Son of God, and we recognize He's God and He's the Son of God. But we can we get to we get to receive the same things Jesus did. Wow! Isn't that amazing? Now, what should that do to us? Well, there's an illustration of this in, in, in the Greek culture of that day, that when a father wanted to, uh, he wanted to make a statement to the community about his son, they, they had a ceremony that they called huiostasia, this word that we use for adoption. But the word is also used for not just adopted sons, but real sons, okay? And what they would do is the father would bring his son into the town square or the gates of the city where the elders sat and where they made all the decisions about that city. And, uh, and he would tell them, now my son has reached the age of 30 and he's a mature son. He's not a teenager anymore. He's not just a young adult. He's a mature son, and I am trusting him with everything that I have and with the affairs and the rights and the authority of my business. So whenever my, my son acts in, re, with regard to my family and my business, then you can be assured that he's acting as a representative of me. And so they would, they would have this ceremony and then the father would say to his, to his son, this, or to the elders of the city, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Isn't it interesting that God used those same words when Jesus was baptized? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. In other words, he was saying, he has all the rights, all the authorities, all the power, that is invested in me, I'm giving to him. And that was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And so we're co-heirs with Jesus. So what God said about Jesus, he also says about you and me. Amen? Wow, what privilege 
what authority, what power, what grace God has made available to us. Now look down at uh, verse 26 in this same chapter. He goes on to say, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Now we all know that we don't always measure up. We don't always have everything that it takes in ourselves. But we have everything that we need in Christ. Okay? So likewise, the Spirit, knowing our weaknesses, helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now this is a verse we all know and can quote by heart, but we often don't understand that it follows what we just read. And all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. How does that happen? As the Spirit prays through us. And we receive the Spirit uh, in, like the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. And they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so when you pray in your spiritual language, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you are always praying in the will of God. Because that's what it says right here. So be confident, uh, even though you don't understand what you're praying, that the Spirit is praying, He's interceding through you to accomplish God's will as you pray in the Spirit. So spiritual language is not just something that you receive when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Many times as, as believers who are Pentecostal, we don't exercise our tongues in the Spirit. And we need to because there's power released through that to appropriate all that the Lord has promised us. And all this happens in community. He says that this inheritance is ours in the saints. That's saying in the church. And so uh, we build one another up we become partners with one another, uh, as Paul says in the end of chapter 2. Uh, we're being built together. We're being uh, uh, fitted together because we need each other. It doesn't just happen with just us and God. It, it happens in the, the assembly as well as in the fellowship of the saints. <clears throat> Final, so it's released through intercession. Through prayer. And the Holy Spirit does that in us. Thirdly, he wants us to know and comprehend what is the incomparable greatness of his power to us who believe. The releasing of it comes through faith. Comes through our, our belief. So what is his power? It's the power that raised him from the dead. It's the power that seated him at God's right hand. It's the power that gave him dominion over all principalities and powers and authorities and dominions in this world and in uh, the, the, the world above and below. Jesus is Lord of all. Amen. Amen? And so <clears throat> how can we come to know the greatness of his power? Well, Paul says in, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, in verse 6, well, in that second paragraph, he says, you were once dead in your own trespasses and sins, but you've been made alive in Christ. And when he raised him from the dead, he raised you from the dead. And when he seated Christ at his right hand, we are seated then. They're with him in the heavenly places. So the same thing that happened to Christ, we're there with him. We're with him because, because he lives, we're going to live forever too. Uh, he, he's uh, seated at the right hand of the Father, so he has all authority in heaven and earth. That means we have all authority in, in heaven and earth. Not to do what we want but to do what God has called us to do. 
Because his kingdom is what's more important. How did Jesus teach the disciples to pray? He says, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. So we worship him. We recognize we have a relationship with God. Holy is his name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's the first prayer after we worship that we should be praying. Then we pray for our daily bread. Then we pray for forgiveness. Then we pray for deliverance. But the first prayer we pray is for God's kingdom to come, his will to be done. And we can accomplish that in the world. We live in a very mixed up and evil world. A lot of that has happened because the church has been sitting on its hands and not doing what we've been called to do. That's where our intercession can make a difference. And God wants to change our community through our intercessory prayer. And so let's turn in conclusion to the end of Ephesians. The sixth chapter, after Paul has given all of his instructions to the church, then he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Well, how? Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, shield of faith, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Then notice what he says in verse 18. Praying at all times or strategically in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to the end keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak. See, the armor of God, most of it's defensive armor. The only offensive piece of armor is the sword of the Spirit. So we've got to know the Word, and then we exercise this character and this Word through prayer. And through intercession, God's going to give us the ability to speak His Word boldly so people will understand the mystery of the Gospel. People don't understand the gospel. They they can put it on the sign, Jesus saves, but they don't always understand what the mystery of the gospel is. Paul's just delineating. You need to read the whole book because it's really full of God's truth about his salvation for us. Amen?